Hi, everyone. I am Kelly, and this is Vote Her In. Vote Her In is a collaboration between Two Broads Talking Politics and Rebecca Sive. Rebecca is the author of Vote Her In, Your Guide to Electing Our First Woman President. Uh, we didn't get quite there, but we got close, and we're all celebrating that. I am going to turn this over now to Rebecca, who will introduce our guest, whom you might recognize from TV. Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> Hi, Kelly, and glad to be here. So yeah, we have a, a true uh, TV star with us this evening, but uh, and she's going to maybe talk a little bit about that. But uh, what we're doing this evening is one, uh, one show in this occasional series of meeting and talking with women artists who both are terrific in their art, but also wonderful role models for other women, women who have spoken out, acted out, helped the community. And in my sort of pantheon, my, if I can call her girlfriend, Kate Malone, a British potter, very distinguished one, is really a leader in this regard. And so we've asked Kate uh, to join us tonight, uh, you know, to talk about her art, but also to talk about her really uh, significant commitment to social justice, to working with people in low income communities, to working with women potters. And, you know, if you would just sort of bear in mind, at least the way that Kelly and I are thinking about these shows with artists that, you know, the concept of voter in is vote all of us in, right? To achieving what we want to achieve, to attaining the goals we want to attain, to being treated equally and, and with respect. So um, that is our broad mantra for this show. And so I want to welcome Kate and thank her. It's it's quite late where she is, um, but she told us she was a night owl and it wouldn't be a problem. So we we took her at her word. And before I ask her the first question, I do want to take a minute. Actually, I'm going to do something I don't usually do, which is to read Kate's bio, because I think um, it'll help you understand a bit about her. So here I go from the website of her dealer. Kate Malone is one of the United Kingdom's leading ceramic artists with an illustrious career spanning 30 years ago. Uh, she has developed an unmistakable and highly ornamented style in her unique handmade pots and intricately ornamental ornamented sculptures. Observations of nature, particularly its fruits, nuts, and berries are the overriding influence in Kate's work. In addition to her exploration of nature, the sophistication of her glazes has led to some interesting collaborations with prominent architects and designers working on inspiring public art projects. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in hospitals, schools, parks, and libraries. She frequently visits schools and her work has been studied as part of Great Britain's National Curriculum for Art for many years. And the TV reference is this. She was a judge on the BBC's The Great Pottery Throwdown uh, her work is, of course, in many museum collections, including the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the personal collection of Rebecca Sai. <laughs> um, but seriously, I uh, am thrilled that Kate's here uh, and can join us and talk a bit about what she's about. So really, Kate, if you could start by sharing with us I think how you came to the realization that you wanted to be an artist, but not just an artist, an artist who had a, you know, an expansive view of her participation in the world and how she could be a part of things, why you chose to become a teacher, which you certainly have been an organizer of community activities uh, and, you know, how that happened and along the way, whether there were, you know, role models who you looked to or mentors who guided you or uh, was it just something, hey, full blown, and you just went for it? So thank you for being here, and let's just chat. Well, thank you for inviting me, Rebecca and Kelly. Um, well, essentially, I didn't plan to be uh, what I am today. I just, like you so well put, uh, Rebecca, I just got my head down and went for it. I wanted to be independent financially and expressively and creatively. And I knew, I found out that I love pottery at school. And I just went for a year on year. And really, um, I'm 62. So I've been, pot and I finished school at 28. So I've been potting for 34 years. 
seems doesn't seem that long but essentially i've just had my head down and i've known what i liked but i've always 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 thought about what other people like it's been part of my psyche i suppose and so i can't say i plan to where i am now but it all seems to make sense in hindsight you know in retrospect um i might have been i was thinking if i hadn't been a potter uh, I might have been a nurse or a doctor or a teacher, a primary school teacher. I think they're my sort of dream jobs, apart from my dream job that I live. And so I think already in my character, I had a sort of caring outward outlook to my my life, I suppose. And my mother and father were very communicative people. So really, um, yeah. Uh, my mum made me drive. She was an independent woman. She got divorced when I was 11 and was financially independent from one way or another. And she always was ducking and diving. And um, I've just done the same all this time. You know, I work in three areas of ceramics. I work on my own work, which I kind of call my selfish work. It's about me, although it has ripples of positive repercussions within my working community because I employ people and support them and encourage them. But that's my sort of me stuff. And then uh, I think potters always in traditionally served a community. So a potter used to make a teapot or a teacup or a bread pension. And they're all things that we use and they served, a, made a service to the community. And because these days that's not, well, actually these, this, these last few years, the potters are going back to tableware and things and it's very much the mode. But essentially, I felt um, that I wanted to serve my community and I wanted to make big pots. I love making big, personally. And so to make public art seemed very logical because public art, I feel, should be informative and uplifting. And so over the last 30 years, as well as making the pots that you'll see on Adrian Sassoon's website, he's got a very nice little section of sold work. So it shows my work through time. I've been with my art dealer for 25 years. And um, so I, that sort of, I, I served a different community by making work, maybe 20 projects, right at the beginning, really, and still now not for profit, really, but to serve a community. It also served a purpose financially. You know, I, I had my career through a couple of great crises in the UK economy. And so to have pieces that were £10 and Ten thousand pounds, and in fact, now I've just finished a project that was one and a half million pounds with architect. So, to have that span of price range, if you like, meant I had more possibilities of managing to make a living through difficult and different times, including this last year, of course, different, different story. But um, yeah, um, I've always been encouraged and I have a husband who's always been right there we had a dream together that I would be a well-known potter and would be a, not a household name if you like and in fact more recently with the throwdown that is the case but to serve our communities we both feel very strongly that we make ourselves strong by making the people around us strong yeah. and I think in politics I know you know I, I'm not a very uh, political animal actually but I feel that the power we have as people is to be good to our neighbours and good to our communities that surround us, be it our family and friends or our residential community, our academic community, and, and every community that we can touch and be a strong part within that. And when you talk about your community and your commitment to others, I, one of the things I want to ask you just as a follow-up here is, uh, why you created the Ball Pond Studio, and if you could share that. And just as a little bit of background, I want to just tell our listeners that um, I saw Kate's work in the Victorian Albert Museum gift shop about 25 years ago, and I bought this little Toby jar that uh, I think we can show you in a moment. And, uh, and then I just decided on a whim, I mean, totally on a whim. I don't think I've ever done this any other time. I walked over to Kate's studio just, I want to meet this woman. Who is this woman? And I walked across London. I didn't know a whole lot, but I found my way. And there she was in this amazing communal space. So, yeah, Kate, if you would talk to us about why you built that intentional community uh, with other uh, artists. Okay, well, um, 
Yes, well, Bulls Pond Studio, we sold it a couple of years ago, um, but it was originally built on a plot of land that my husband and I bought in 1986. My husband's a builder. And so he said he would build me a studio for me uh, with a giant, and I always wanted a giant kiln. And in London, in England, a big kiln's not as common as America. And um, so it made sense to share the kiln with others financially and to make the whole project feasible. And we had a dream that we'd make a little building that was, and it was really before the time of group workshops. In that time, most potters were working individually and independently. There was one other communal studio in London called 401 and a half down in southwest London. Um, and so we opened this Graham built and we gradually rented out spaces. Uh, this tiny little flagship custom built studio in our back garden, really, in a derelict house that we bought in Hackney that was built in 1812. We built this lovely little modern unit which we then put a giant kiln in and a small kiln. And we had 14 members having space there to make their own work, ranging in age from 18 to 76. And about some, often seven nationalities, often residents from Africa and all different places. And, you know, and I made it work not for profit. I made everybody paid rent and uh, it ran as a little powerhouse for ceramics in the 80s, which was quite rare. Thanks to Graham, I should say, my husband, who built it and didn't want profit from his work. It took him seven years indiv individually to build it with his own hands. So before Kelly, uh, Kelly is going to talk with Kate a bit now, but before she does, can you just show a couple images, Kelly, and then bring us back to you and Kate? Yeah, so... Just give people an idea of Kate's work, both big and small. Oh, all right. So can you see the so that's, slide that's up? That is the Toby jar that I mentioned uh, from the mid 70s from the Victorian Albert Museum. Mm -hmm. It was and called Carnival Wear. What? It was called Carnival Wear. So it was about, oh. mm -hmm. it was about Carnival. Mm -hmm. And then we'll look at one more. Yeah, here. Tell us about these, Kate. Oh, I'll mute myself. Am I unmuted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am unmuted. So those are just little containers based on seed pods. When you open an avocado or a bean, you you find a cavity when you take the seed away. And so they were just little containers. And I'm so pleased. I know you've had them for a very long time, Rebecca. It means so much. Uh, pieces are never really complete until they are found a home. And you have obviously given them a loving home all these years. I mean, that was, I think it was not the 70s, it was the 80s, so, you know, 30 years ago. My work hasn't changed that much. <laughs> so, uh, Kate, I wanted to ask you some about your teaching too. You talked about how your, uh, your pottery is diverse in the different kinds of things that you do. And your teaching is also diverse in different kinds of contexts. How do you, how do you approach that, that different kind of teaching that you do? And, and tell us a little bit about what you, what you get out of teaching, why it's important to you. Well, I suppose um, at the beginning, I had a day a week's lecturing at a university to earn enough money to live. But at the same time, when you're teaching, you're learning, you're verbalizing and building your own philosophy. So that was the sort of standard expected way to teach. Um, and I found that very, very stimulating. But at the same time, I, I feel very strongly about teaching young children. Uh, I think my work, uh, and if you look on my website, uh, the pieces that Rebecca's shown show a little bit, but it's all about touching the spirit, touching the heart. Uh, it's all about nature, and it's very easy for teachers, like elementary school teachers and primary and secondary school teachers, to go out and buy a pineapple or a pumpkin or a mango and then show it to the kids and then show them my work. So it's a very direct and immediate impact thing. and. Um, I have letters from teachers every week who use my website. So I built my website not to sell things. There are a few things occasionally for sale, 
But um, essentially, I built my website as a communication tool for teachers. So you can look at my sketchbooks in my website. You can look at all the catalogs and films. It's more a sort of archive, really. But I didn't build it with the intention to sell from it. It's very much an educational tool. And um, so I get invitations to individual schools. But I found the energy I had to put in to get to them and to run those workshops. I thought my time was better spent on a on a, on trying to reach out to a wider set of people. And so I often go to six. There's a big organization to help children, young people, 16, 17, 18 years old in England, to choose their career. So I'd often spend my time going to conferences and talking to 600 or 1,000 16-year-olds about my own story and about how I, you know, I've built everything that I have. I have always had very small and simple studios. I've kept things very realistic and I talked to them. So, and then of course the BBC came along with this idea to do the Great Pottery Throwdown. And to me, it was, I've been, I've been searching about how to most effectively spend my time and communicate the wonder of ceramics and the powers. It's an empowering and enabling uh, material for a young person to use because you embrace all the physics of things and you go through scientific changes and you feel very clever because there's material transformation. So for a young person to make a pot and get it through these processes and learn patience and also to go into the zone of the pleasure of working is a really powerful thing. Not to make a nation of potters, which would be great, but to make a nation of people who know how to use their hands and are connected. And so when the BBC came along, it was just, you know, it, it was actually very demanding. They don't pay very much because it's a public broadcasting thing. In fact, I and Keith lost money while we were doing it and we were exhausting. We were actually clinically exhausted by the end of it because the, the, the film crew didn't know about pottery, so we were teaching behind the scenes as well. But the fact is that that, and I know that uh, America's seen it recently. It's been on your television. And it was about five years ago. I don't do it anymore. It's kind of history for me. But it was 8.5 million people in England watched it. And they learned the pleasures of it. And these great characters go through this, the journey, which you'll have seen, of learning and showing them themselves to be creative and brave. But everybody understood now why a mug costs 20 pounds. You know, before they'd say, oh, that's so much money. And now they buy two. So the effect has been absolutely incredible. The BBC decided to have a whole year called Get Creative. So they did, you know, they invested in a lot of programs like that. And it's just the transformation has been great. And in fact, when I started uh, judging, I said to the producers, you know, my dream would be that every town might have a communal kiln where people could go and make like like old in old days they'd have a bread oven and people would fire their bread and so and actually it really is happening you know so many towns and in, in cities these communal spaces which is a sort of model on not a model of bulls pond but it echoes the empathy of bulls pond studio of sharing equipment because it makes sense because it's expensive but also sharing the pleasure of making and showing and selling and taking home so it's such an empowering thing and you know hats off to the bbc and now it's channel it's a it's a it's an individual it's the channel four now it's changed a little bit but really it's just been fantastic fantastic and and the pleasure from that the pleasure from kids coming up to me when i go to my village fair and sort of saying i want to be a potter or i loved it and I, you know is just so it's quite it sounds like I've been quite altruistic on thinking about others, but the actual, it's like having a drug, you know. <laughs> Lovely. So when you're thinking about others and the rewards both to yourself and to them, you know, one of the things we wanted to ask you to talk about uh, was, you know, two more recent or two current projects working in India in a couple of different places, I think, and also in Great Britain in this communal context and particularly in underserved communities. And um, if, uh, if you could talk a bit about that, and I think then we have one slide we'll show when um, you're finished talking, just so people get one sense of it. Okay, so well, just at the moment, I, these two projects that 
which were sort of little ideas that have become very real and big. I have, I'm running two projects. Uh, one is I love going to India. I've been going for 35 years, nearly every year. And over time, I've formed professional and friend relationships there. And the more we went, the more we felt that we wanted to maybe combine work with travel, because it gets a bit boring if you're on holiday all the time. And so there have been a few, lots of times, whenever I've gone, I've taught for free at art colleges, written to them ahead and given lectures and community, sort of spread arms across the sea, if you like, like we're doing now. Um, and that sort of grew into learning about educational as a fantastic foundation, an NGO called Agastya, who believes every child should have equal opportunity. And they take the, the classroom, mathematical and scientific games out to the villages in vans and in backpacks, and they reach a huge, huge amount of really tribal people and educate children in a very playful way. And I also made contact with this amazing foundation that's linked on Gandhi's philosophy of uh, craft of the village empowering a community. They've been giving out pottery kilns and potter's wheels, 35,000 a year across, trying to revive pottery in India because plastic and aluminium has made a lot of pottery redundant domestically. And so um, I kind of linked up with them and met them. And I was sort of in, just before lockdown in February of, of last year, I was in India and I went to these different foundations and, and touring India, met extraordinary factory owners who own missionary factories from the 1700s where they made roof tiles that got exported all over the world through the Industrial Revolution. And, and I was at the, at the point of thinking, well, wouldn't it be fun to link everybody up? You know, this tribal community who teach women to pot in the south of India with this foundation, with a great Biennale that's in Cochin, and have some kind of big happening. And I was touring India uh, in February, trying to think how we might get grants or money to and to take my team also out to India. Who, You know, I took them a few years ago to the Triennale in India myself. To, for them to see the beauty of India, my uh, studio team. But um, I wanted to bring them together. And then lockdown happened. And I got an email from the one place called the Center of Social Development, right down at the tip of India, where the three seas meet and facing Sri Lanka. And this man who I'd met, one of these men who run the Center for Social Development, who's a great pillar of a community who runs a pottery, but also helps the community, asked me if I had 800 pounds he had 800 pounds and he wanted to um, try and feed a tribal community of itinerant workers who'd returned home, but they had no home and they just set up in the forest. And I said, I can give you 800 pounds, but what I'll do is I'll, I never sell on my Instagram. I never sell on my website, really. I'll put some pineapples that I had made myself for the wall of my studio here in Kent to put on the garden wall. I said, I'll put them online. And to cut a, well, I'm already making it a long story, but we raised £20,000 and we were able to send the money straight out to this person who I completely trusted, who went around with a truck with rice and Ayurvedic drinks to boost the immune system and masks and soap and, you know, and everything and medical supplies. And so that went on all through lockdown. And really, so my bond with them, which really evolved, like everything that I seem to do, I don't really plan it has become very strong and now they really want to run a program to train women potters in the whole of the south of india uh, and so we you know we may be going to fundraise we haven't done now in the future because they're in a second crisis and lockdown but um and i'm just about to do an instagram campaign with some bigger pineapples to try and start phase two of that because we stopped because everything seemed to be okay and the other <laughs> so that's sort of something that's evolved and is very exciting and it connects you with people. It's all about connecting with people, isn't it? So, and I'm connecting with this fantastic pillar of a community in India. But also I've connected with this man who's a very wealthy man in England. And together, um, just before lockdown, again, we, start, we decided we wanted to, he helped run a youth zone in England. They have these after-school clubs that are very glamorous. They cost £8 million each to build, and they're equipped with, 51 activities for kids, but not so many art. And so he brought me in and said he'd like to 
maybe do a fundraiser to put a couple of studios with teachers into these centers for a couple of years. And so we cooked up a plan to ask 32 of England's predominantly most famous potters, Edmund de Waal, Magdalene Dundas, the greats, the real senior greats, if they would give a piece to the, to, to the project, I mean, it's called Fired Up Four, and then we auctioned it with a great online auction house who offered to do it for free. And that just sounds so simple. Of course, it was so complicated to organize. But we did. We, uh, last year, the auction in November, we raised £120,000. We've built two studios that are nearly up and running that will service about 500 kids a week. Who, and these studios are built in underprivileged areas where marginalized and vulnerable children really are, genuinely, really. So it's sort of hitting the place where I think it's most important. Uh, and that's been a great pleasure. And we're about, I've got a Zoom meeting tomorrow. We're starting phase two. So we're going to ask the, the founder potters, but also a whole new set and try and build two more studios. And, the, and once we get the ball rolling, I think the big funders of this particular charity will then build in pottery studios in all their new centres, which is our objective. And their objective is to have 100 centres in England by 2040. So I don't know if I'll be still alive. But uh, we are making a difference already. Hmm. I'm going to mute myself now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, speaking of uh, making a difference, uh, you know, one of the things uh, Rebecca pointed out to me is uh, what a role model you are to uh, to other women artists, to other women potters. You know, and some of that is just through the work that you do, uh, but some of that is through, you know, your leadership qualities and your uh, things about your personality. Can you talk some of, about that, about being a role model and and what you see as sort of the, the pieces of your uh, personality, the things that you have developed uh, that, that lead to that, that, that make people look up to you as a role model? Oh, you're still muted, Kate. So I still find it so funny that anybody would think I'm a role model because I'm really, you know, I have quite a tidy desk today, but uh, I always seem to be one step behind. But um, uh, I remember saying to somebody when I was teaching to another teacher, when we were trying to do a big assessment week and it was all very complicated, I said, by the end of the week, it'll all be sorted. And he said, it won't all be sorted. Nothing's ever all sorted. And you have to just roll with it, Kate. As well. Big lesson. But essentially, I mean, I was chairman of debates and I was head of the social social parties when I was a sixth former at school, age 17, 18. I was deputy head girl. So I suppose I've always been quite bossy. My husband says I'm very bossy. Um, um, but I think, I don't know, a natural trait. I don't know. I mean, again, I didn't set out to be a role model. What's quite interesting is, so I, I do believe, so I have, I have a studio and I have nine assistants. I did have before lockdown, was straggling along. And I had them for two days a week, um, so working for me. So they had enough money to, to have their own practice and to, to build their own practice and hopefully eventually leave me because they'd be strong enough not to need me in a way. And... Um, I think, and I, and the reason I had assistance is because I wanted things done. It wasn't all me thinking, you know, I never looked for an assistant. They always came and asked, but, and I very rarely say no. Sadly, I have to say no more often these days. But essentially, I think I sort of led the studio and then I, it felt good. And so by feel, it feeling good, you just do more of that because one wants to be a good part of the community. Again, it's about power. We're powerless in big politics, I feel. We're not powerless, of course, we have a vote. But the real difference we can make is with our own communities, and therefore it's just kind of happened. Um, I did get, a couple of years ago, I haven't got, have I got, I haven't got the photo here, I got an MBE from the Queen, uh, member of the British some, Empire. And that's my services to ceramics. And it's really interesting because I thought it was great. You know, it was like, oh, my God, how fantastic. Took my dad, took my husband and daughter, and we, had, we went to Buckingham Palace. It was just fantastic. 
But um, what it has done now, and I, I, that was when I was 60, very interesting, uh, is consolidated the fact that um, I do have that role. So therefore, it's making me take on the role more, uh, voluntarily, of course. But it means that also with that, you do have power within things to get things done. So it's a waste not to use it. It's a very clever system, giving people MBEs and OBEs, because it makes them be more of what they've been acclaimed for. So it's a, I'm, that's quite interesting. Um, but altogether, I just feel, yeah, I just, I just want to be, a, I think, I want to be strong. You, can, you can't be strong in, that's, we could go into Brexit and we could go into independence and things like that. You can't, you can't be strong alone. Everybody around you has to be or should be. And we're, we're not, we are artists and we're expressing ourselves as individuals, but we're part of a continuum, be that a line of time or a place in space. And you, we just have to do our best within it. I, I've always felt that. So related to, you know, where our place is, where artists' uh, place is, one of the things that seems to be changing a bit these days is the role of women in more uh, craft media than historically they've been in. You know, ceramics and textiles are pretty typical for women, but, um, you know, metalwork, woodworking. And so there are women, we see and feel women in more places in the art world than we did previously. And it's also the case that institutions, for a variety of reasons, are feeling now that they need to be more responsive to women artists, to collect women's art, to show women's art. I'm wondering whether you know you could just talk a little bit about why you think that's happened or how it's happening. Whether you think it has to do with this external political work that you know people like I or Kelly do, or really the push comes from the arts themselves. I think it comes from the heart itself, and art is a part of heart. Art is within the word heart. And I think women have a big heart. Our hearts are more uh, are more free to express themselves now. And I think it is indeed your work. It's um, the ceramics, my ceramics world has been populated by women. When I started out as an 18 year old student, there was a woman who was, you know, the hot thing, you know, in, at the time, Jill Crowley. and um, and there were great figureheads, really, who, and I sort of think I'm quite competitive. That's something that Kelly asked me about my basic character. I have two brothers. I come from a sporting family. My dad was a football commentator and crazy about sport. And I think I'm quite competitive. And I, I was looking at your question. And I think the women, when I was younger, I was a bit competitive. I wanted to be as good as them, if not better. And uh, I think that's something... It's quite difficult to admit, actually. You know, yes, of course they were role models, but I thought I could, you know, do better. And I hope there are young women and men, young people out there, who think they can do better than me. And I jolly well hope they do. You know, and that's that's part of it. It's fascinating, really. Um, I wonder. You see, you've got the oldest, the oldest ceramic thing is the the something of Wollendorf. It's a little, very, quite a beast figure, amazing woman figure with breasts and hips. It's almost like a triangle, this really great figure. You can look it up when the oldest, the oldest figure ever found. And I, can, I don't believe a man made that figure. You know, I think obviously <laughs> women have been doing all these things all this time, but then we've got the media to sort of show it. I mean, I was just in an Elizabethan house last week of embroideries, amazing political and narrative embroideries of epic legends and Greek myths. And they weren't, they, and they were from the 1670s, 1700s. They weren't men's hands that sewed them. They've always been there. And to me, the fact that they're there is more important than whether it was a woman or a man, I think. It's more important. I'd, I'd like to think that maybe my blackberry or my pineapple, my favorite pieces I've ever made, little pots. I'd like to think in five years, a thousand years time, I'll be gone, of course. They'll be there. But I don't necessarily want them to say that's a Kate Malone. They won't, I doubt. They'll, they'll say this is a pot. 
And so it's the presence of the object that counts. And we've been making, we, women haven't not been making since 25,000 BC. There's no way we've not been making. Um, but we have had to bring the making into domestic activities, be that sewing, not necessarily metal work and not necessarily kind of woodwork, but all the sort of domestic things. And maybe that's what's kept it down because they were domestic. And now we're appreciating that the domestic is more important sometimes than the fine arts. And so there is a great resurgence. And I think it's um, very much a woman's world, the ceramic world at the moment. Very much. Very much. There's a great... So, uh, oh, go yeah. ahead. No, carry on, Kelly. No, it's fine. I, well, I was just going to say that uh, speaking of these domestic arts, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast are knitters, myself included, or sewers, uh, or who maybe, you know, sort of paint for fun, things like that. Uh, but I, you know, I think a lot of us would love to know how to be more supportive of women who are professional artists, women like you. Can you talk some about what what we can all be doing to, to be more supportive of uh, women artists? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. Um, and again, I think it should be supportive of the arts. I think young boys are quite quite oppressed by all, all the sort of attention, especially, I don't know, um, how can they help? They can, they can buy something from a potter, <laughs> you know, for $10 or $20, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot and you can show your support because the, the finances are something that we all depend upon to keep going, to express ourselves. Um, how can they? I don't know, I think they have to, well, how would I say? I think appreciation across the board from people who are very wealthy and collectors, that's an appreciation who buy things, but simply to enjoy them, go and see them, go and see them in the museums and things. There are great collections. America's so full of extraordinary collections of craft and women's art. And I think just go and see it and share it. I think that's, I think that's probably the best way. So in that vein, I want uh, uh, Kelly to show uh, our guests uh, here. I think there's another image of a of, of very glamorous Kate in one of her very big pots in, that she has there. It's a power image, isn't it? I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I made that piece. Uh, for Manchester City Art Gallery. And one of the things we haven't touched about in our conversation is um, symbolism and the objective of my, uh, I'm inspired by nature and here's a pineapple. When I first made, made my first pineapple, I had no idea that it's a symbol of hospitality and friendship and welcome and wealth in uh, history. Because in England to have a pineapple meant that you'd either shipped it as a live plant from the tropics or you'd had enough money to have a hot house to keep it hot enough to grow it in England. So to, sh so to share the juice of a pineapple was the ultimate in decadence and a symbol of friendship that you valued someone's friendship enough to share it. So this pineapple, which also looks a bit like a crown, it's wearing a crown, it's very triumphant, I think, um, it appealed to me because I loved the pineapple, everything about it. And later on, I discovered that it does have symbolic implications. And in the same respect, I was drawn to pumpkins. And if you look at my website and if you just put into Google images, you'll see my pumpkins. And I was drawn to them simply because I had friends who had a home. Uh, they lived in the Canary Islands and there were pumpkin fields all over the Canary Islands, which are lava stone. So these black black fields with these amazing pumpkins when the leaves had died back just sitting there and I started making pumpkins also inspired by a wooden pumpkin that I bought in India but essentially then I realized that they are symbols Diego Rivera used them and I started researching it of fecundity of fertility of womanhood they are the ultimate sort of full and I re realized that they're very tenacious pumpkins because they, they last into the autumn and they sit, you know, they're really extraordinary. Like women, in a way, is that they sit bold and strong and they're full of surprises and they're very tenacious and 
suffer a lot, have to suffer a lot of endurance. And so this pumpkin to me is a huge image. And the spiral stem that comes off the top of my pumpkins is really about life improving. Uh, a spiral and a stem growing up in India is about purity and meditation. So that fertility, fecundity, purity, meditation, and the full right pumpkin has been a huge part of my objective to cry to, to when you, my objective is, I go back to this Venus of Wollendorf, this little figure. When I saw it in the British Museum in a show, it it hit me in my sort of chest, in my abdomen, really. It was an emotional response, not a mental response. And uh, my work, the objective of my pumpkins, which I think is the one where it's most successful, is to do that, is to make you gasp with the technical prowess of the glazes. And we haven't really talked about my glazes, the science of my glazes. And uh, but so it sort of hits you in the stomach, but then of course you wonder about the technical ability. I have the largest crystalline glaze archive in the country. I have a huge directory of my own recipes that I use as a palette to work with interior designers and architects and as a palette for my own selfish studio work and I shouldn't call it I should, decorative art I think decorative art is a very interesting thing to talk about as well because I don't know if that is a term that's used commonly uh, in America but you have fine art and craft and then decorative art and it's you know it fine art can be decorative art craft can be decorative art but there's this whole area that decorative arts which is really textiles jewelry glass ceramics and metalwork where it's decorative, was very diminutive 20 years ago. To be a decor to decorate pots was really, you know, like not very high brow. And nowadays it's much, much more widely accepted to be. I, I, I'd rather label myself a decorative artist than a fine artist. That's a personal thing. Did I answer your question? You did. And, you know, in your inimitable fashion, you are inspirational, brilliant, encouraging, uh, voting her in as you talk about the power of women's crafts and women standing up for themselves. So I want to thank you, Kate, for taking the time. I know it's past midnight or something like that where you are and hope that you'll get a good night's sleep and that uh, we'll keep sharing and and talking about why it's so important for all kinds of women to come together as as we have tonight. So thank you again so much. It's yes. absolutely a pleasure, and I think you you know obviously do great work. And I think um, I was talking with my lovely PA Sakib, who we've been dealing with with things. And I think the sort of final message is: yes, indulge yourself, but the important thing is to be helping and kind to our community. And uh, I think that's if we can take that on, if we can sort ourselves out and then realize that we're slightly sorted out, never, we'll never be totally sorted out. But then to look outside that and to see where you can help. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how we are for time, but you know, I literally appeal to potters to go to the, the school that's closest to their kiln and go and offer help. You know, it's, it's not happening in schools, pottery. And uh, I, I appealed three or four years ago, I was giving a big conference and I appealed. And I thought, bloody hell, I'm not doing that myself. So I went to my local school, knocked on the door and said, can I come and look at what you're doing in your curriculum? And I worked with six and seven year olds doing Roman coins out of clay. And I just did one little kill node and they all took coins home. And it was the most and the teacher was like, oh, my God, we have no money to do anything like this. But it was only at the end of my road. So I was able to bring it back to my studio and deal with it. And if we all do that, if we can all do that, no matter what, not what to do, but you know, if we've got any skill, we need to try and put it where it's needed. That's, a, that's exactly right. Thank you so much for saying that. It's a message that we all need to hear, can hear, and we all have something to contribute. So thanks so much, Kate. Yes, thank you. And uh, American audiences, you can go to HBO Max and see great uh, British pottery throwdown, and it's really excellent. So everyone <laughs> should go check it out. All right, thank you. Thank you.